middleware will install and deploy Tivoli Systems Automation to automate the failover of the highly available DB2 HADR disaster recovery solution. Today's webcast is interactive, so you may ask a question at any time using the chat window located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Today's session is also being recorded, and you'll be provided a copy of today's materials following the call. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Paul. Take it away. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Stroud. I'm one of the IT and support engineers here at IBM. And um, today I'm going to take you through creating, um, installing, and, and creating the automation for uh, the DB2 HADR um, when used with ITN and, and SIM database. Let's get started. Uh, so our agenda today is we'll view a working setup. Um, if you do not have a working HADR setup already, uh, those two links will provide you the information on how to do so. Um, but that is a requirement for today's agenda, um, and we'll talk about that more later. We're going to install system automation. We're going to prepare the systems for the cluster automation. We're going to configure the cluster automation. Then once we're done with that, we'll test and explain some of the failover scenarios. Then we'll update the ITNM core and ITNM tip servers, ensure the proper functionality on both, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. Uh, as we're going through the, the presentation today, I'll be swapping out, and I'll actually be doing the work as we're going through the slides today. So we'll, we'll keep the two in sync. So the requirements are, as I said earlier, working DB2 HADR setup. Uh, again, if you don't have that, follow the links on the previous page, and, and that should get you to that spot. Uh, the latest DB2 fix pack installed. It's not a requirement, uh, but should be considered best practice. And um, for today, we'll be installing uh, systems automation from the DB2 fix pack installation media. Uh, you'll need root access on the DB2 servers and um, uh, DB2 instance access on the DB2 servers as well. You'll need an unused IP address to use that will be used to fail between the servers. So uh, there will be an IP address that, that will all fail over between the two servers and it will follow the active database uh, once we're done setting this up. Uh, you'll need the DB2 fix pack or install media. Um, again, to that's where the uh, system automation installation media is. Uh, you'll also possibly need the ITNM GA media, um, and we'll get into more of that in the next slide. Here's an archi well, the slide after this one. Uh, here's an architectural overview of our target environment. Um, so we've got our core 411 server and our TIP 411 server down at the bottom, going across the network to the DB2 servers. Uh, you see an ITNM SIP in the middle, and that is a service IP address. And we'll be talking about that and explaining what that is later. But essentially, that's the, the IP address that will fail over between the two DB2 servers and follow the active database for us. <clears throat> now we'll prepare and uh, install system automation. So again, you need to install the latest DB2 fix pack. and uh, installing system automation may not be required depending on how you installed DB2. Uh, DB2 10.1, starting with DB2 10.1, uh, system automation is installed by default um, if you install DB2 using normal DB2 installation media. If you installed DB2 using the ITNM DB media, DB2 media, then we skip the system automation install, and you'll have to install it. So that's where we'll actually be starting the process today, is by installing SAM, because that may be uh, necessary uh, in many of the environments, again, depending on how DB2 was installed. Uh, the license that is included on the DB2 fix pack media is a try and buy license. Uh, and if you look at the actual license name, it will say uh, SAM32 TB LIC, and we'll look at that in just a minute. Um, and if you're using TV media or a TV license, try and buy license, it's only good for 90 days. Uh, if you have your uh, DB2 GA media, so your general availability media, or your ITNM general availability media, you will be able to go in and find the SAM 3.2 license file. 
uh, and basically you just need to copy that to the DB2 media from where we'll be installing it from. Um, and so that will give you a permanent license uh, for the install. Uh, these are the RPMs that will be installed. Um, so you can look at these and see if, see if uh, RSCT and, and system automation are already installed on your system. And let's go ahead and take a look at that now. So here are our two DB2 servers. We have DB2-101A and DB2-101B. Um, and they are currently in a DB2 HADR setup. I'll show you that. Here are our DB2 instance owners. And if we look, DB2 PD, DB, so what this shows us is the status of the ITNM HADR environment. ITNM is the database, and then this is the information for HADR. You can see that DB2101A is currently the primary machine. It is in a peer state, and the two are connected. That's very important. It must be in this state to do this process that we're doing today. Uh, if you are not in this state, you need to work to get into this state uh, before we move ahead with the process. We can also see it on this machine that we are in the same status. Okay, so this is the standby machine. You can see that they are in a peer state and that they are connected. All right, so we will now go to our install SAM. Okay, so here's our install SAM from the DB2, in, in fact, DB2 10.1 Fixed Pack 5 media. Uh, I use DB2 10.1 because that's what we ship with 411 and we're shipping with 4.2. Uh, this works as well with DB2 10.5, but again, I would suggest you get to the latest Fixed Pack for DB2, whatever that is, on your version. So let's quickly take a look here in our license directory, and you'll see that I have the SAM 32.lice, which is the license that I copied from the ITNM GA Media, uh, and the SAM 32 TB license is the license that came with the uh, DB2 fixed pack media. So the, the install SAM on the fixed pack media is a full install. It just doesn't come with the full license because the fixed pack media is downloadable without uh, entitlement. So. Okay, so that's what we have now, and we'll go ahead, and at this point, we can install SAM on, on both DB2A, DB2101A, and DB2101B. And you'll have to accept the license agreement, and that will start installing. I will show you, while this one is installing, I'll show you on this one um, that if we look for system automation or RSCT, currently they are not there. Um, RSCT stands for Reliable Scalable Cluster Technology, which is the actual underlying technology that all this will run under. Um, all right, so this is still installing, and we'll go ahead and run the install SAM over here as well. Accept the license and let that install complete. You'll see a lot of these. Um, a lot of these are translations. All the .msg um, packages are translation files, so um, they're not. When I when I listed the packages that would would be installed, I did not list. Um, the message files. So it looks like there's a lot more installing, but really they're only translation files. 
Okay, and it's applying the e-fixes here. So we're moving through the process. While that's going, we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay. Go back over. All right, so our installation is complete. Um, you'll see here a warning that says you must set CT management scope. And uh, CT management scope is really beyond the scope of what we're going to cover today. Uh, but there's information about it on the, um, in the links at the end of the documentation. There are several additional resource links at the end of the presentation today. And there's a best practices guide and uh, general information for running system automation. And this is covered in there. For our purposes today, we're going to set it to two, um, which is going to be what you set it to anyhow. But if you'd like to understand why, then it is in the documentation. So, and we will do that on our other server as well. All right. Okay. And now we'll switch back over to our presentation. Okay. So, at this point, we've installed SAM. That's the entirety of it. It's um, it's not a complicated process. It doesn't start or do anything. Um, once you install it, it's just there. Uh, so we've completed that. Um, the next thing we need to do is uh, we've already exported our CT management scope. Um, and you'll want to set that uh, because you can also run commands as the DB2 instance owner. You'll want to make sure the CT management scope is also set for your DB2 instance owner as well as root. You'll want to set that in your environment. Uh, the next thing we need to do is copy over the TSA scripts. So again, if, if you did not install DB2 via the uh, ITNM media, this is not something you will have to do. This is only if you installed DB2 using the um, ITNM media and we did not install TSA with DB2. Uh, it's a very simple process. Um, uh, it's a single command process. And we'll let that complete. Um, and that will copy over the necessary scripts for the high availability. Um, and let me talk about this now uh, while I'm talking about the scripts. Uh, system automation, um, a lot of what we're going to do today and, and once we're complete, it's going to look, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to look pretty complicated. Um, but in essence, what system automation does is it has a set of scripts that it uses to start, stop, and monitor the processes. And that's essentially the core of what it does. So it has a script that tells it how to monitor DB2. And what action, and, and in the rest of the rules, it has the actions on what to take uh, should certain situations present themselves. Um, but at its core, again, all it does is run scripts and, and monitor start and stop things based on relationships within the product. Um, and they'll all be built automatically uh, by DB2. OK, so let's locate our DB2 CTTSA script. And I have it in several shared directories. You likely will not. Uh, so we will copy over our scripts. OK, so we've done those. Let's go back over here. OK, so a couple more points. Um, host names are critical, um, extremely critical. You are going to want to make sure that all your host names and all your IP addresses are defined in your host file on all the machines in your cluster. Um, the uh, clustering technology uses the host name um, extensively. And you don't want your cluster to fail because your DNS server is down. So you want to make absolutely sure that all the machines are, are defined, both short name and fully qualified name, in your host file. Um, it's very important. It will, if, if, if you don't have this, um, it's entirely possible that the setup process we are doing today won't complete properly. Um, the next thing we need to talk about is preparing the nodes. 
this is a command, prep RP node, and it's got to be run um, as root on both machines, uh, identifying both machines in the cluster. So in our case, we will go to db2.108 and we'll do prep RP node db2.101a, db2.101b, and then we will go over to b and essentially run the same thing, prep RP node to 101b, db2.101a. Okay, so now our nodes are prepared to be a part of the cluster. And that's the last thing we need to do as root. Now we're going to go over to the DB2 instance owner and run the DB2 haiku script. The DB2 haiku script is the one that's going to do all the work. Uh, it's going to create the cluster. It's going to create all the resources within the cluster. It's going to create the relationships between the resources in the cluster and do all the other um, setup necessary for the cluster environment. Um, and, and you'll see that as we run through it. Um, the uh, link there is uh, essentially what this process was built from. So it goes through the entire process of building the HADR database as well as running DB2 Haiku and all the stuff we're doing today, um, as well as some failover and testing um, scenarios. So it's a good reference uh, to use in addition to this as well. So let's go ahead and get started on that. So DB2 Haiku, when you read that documentation, it must be run on the backup server first. Um, so let's find out where it resides. All right, so we're going to run, let's ensure, well, we need to run it as the instance owner. Um, DB2 Haiku has to be run as the distance, the uh, instance owner. It does have some actions um, that are based on root that it must take, but because of the way it's been built, it can be run and, and in fact must be run as the instance owner. So let's go ahead and run that, and we'll talk through these questions uh, it's asking and kind of explain them as we're going through the process. Okay, so the first question it asks us is, it says that we did not find a cluster on this machine. Uh, to, conf to, conf to continue configuring your cluster for high availability, you must create a cluster now. So we yes, we want to go ahead and create a cluster and continue, or create a domain and continue. The cluster is built on the domain. Uh, we will name ours ITNM HADR. How many nodes will it contain? It's going to contain two nodes, DB2101B, DB2101A. And it asks if we want to create the domain now. Yes. And so that's actually creating the domain and setting up the cluster on the machine now. take just a second. All right, now it's asking about a quorum device. And the quorum device is, is important. Um, there is the concept of a split brain scenario is what it's termed. And essentially it's where the two failover DB2 servers can't talk to each other. So they both want to be the primary server. They say, okay, if the, I can't talk to the other server. I need to be the primary server. Well, the problem with this is only one can be the primary server and only one should be accepting transactions. So what the quorum does is it allows us a way to say, okay, if both of you are primary, only the one that can do this can actually be the primary. And in our case, what we're going to use is a network quorum. And what that's going to be is we're going to point this at the at a at a IP address, it's suggested you use a a uh, DNS server or something along those lines that you expect to always be active. Um, in our case today, we're going to be using the default gateway uh, for the network. So, um, if both servers were were to be up but unable to communicate with one another, uh, 
the one that was the first one to um, ping and, and get, a get a successful response from the gateway would be the one that took over primary. So we're going to configure that now. We're going to do a network quorum. And here we're providing the gateway address. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we have to add the network cards. I talked a little bit about it earlier, about the, the floating IP address. Well, in system automation terminology, it's called the service IP address. Um, and what the service IP address is, is it's literally a secondary address that moves between the machines that gives you a single point of contact to wherever the active database is. Um, so we, we talked about the extra IP address earlier, and that's what this is used for. So this IP literally floats between the two servers um, as, it, as it becomes active, as the database becomes active on that server. And it's actually just a secondary interface. If you look at your if config output um, on your primary server, what you'll see is an if config ETH x dot zero or x colon zero, and that will hold the address for our service IP address. Uh, should there be a failure on that machine, and we'll see this work in, in, in live, um, a live demonstration later, uh, that, that that IP address will move around as, as the database moves around. So we'll go ahead and set that up now. Um, what we're going to do first is, is create a network uh, for them to work on, and we want it to be an, a public network. Um, you can have an a internal network, so a, an additional set of interfaces where you run a private network for just um, for communication between the two servers. Um, in our case, uh, we won't be doing that. Uh, we just have a single interface on these machines, so that's all we'll be using today. All right, and here it's asking, okay, so we've created this public network. Do you want to add the ETH0 interface on DB2101B to the public network? Yes, we want to do that. And it says, which, which network do you want to put it on? And we want to put it on the, the DB2 public network that we just created. Now it's going to ask us if we want to add the ETH0 interface from DB2101A to the network. And we'll tell it yes. OK, now it's asking us how we want the, um, how we want the cluster manager to be um, who we want the cluster manager to be. And in this case, we want the cluster manager to be system automation or TSA. You'll see it called TSA, TSAMP, SAMP, um, but it's system automation for multiple platforms. And, and uh, so don't be confused by seeing multiple different uh, acronyms for it. OK, and this is going to, I believe, be the last stage of our setup on the backup server. Okay, so it's asking us now if we want to validate and automate HADR failover for the HADR database. Uh, we cannot do that yet because we have not run the configuration on the primary server yet. Um, so we're going to go ahead and tell it no here. And that's all we have to do on the backup server. Now we'll move over to the primary server and run the same. the same command. Okay, so you'll notice that it immediately goes to asking us how we, who we want the cluster manager to be. So it went out and it figured out that the, the domain was already there, that the cluster is already set up, that it's already been added to the cluster. And so at this point, we're going to tell it we want TSA, and then it's going to do the service IP setup, and we'll see that in just a second. All right. And it says, do you want to validate and automate the HADR failover for the HADR database? So yes, we wanted to do that. And there it's adding the HADR database ITNM to the domain. So this is specific to the ITNM database. Had we had additional databases there, there would be additional questions. This will take just a second.
should be much longer. There we go. All right, so it said it was able to add it. It was successful, and now it's asking us if we want to configure the virtual IP or service IP address for the HADR database. So yes, we want to go ahead and do that. Okay, so our IP address is 10.192.154.40. It must be an unused address. If it can ping the address at this point in the process, it will come back and tell you that that's not a valid address and that you cannot use it. Enter the subnet, and it's asking us if we want to use this on the public network that we created. So we'll tell it yes. And that's it. So at this point, our domain is complete. It's Everything is set up, and we can actually see that. Let's, um, let's move on to our next slide now. So we've completed all this, and now we're going to talk about monitoring and testing failover. Uh, so LSAM is the TSAMP monitoring utility, uh, and there's some usage and examples there. We're going to just use very little of it today, but we'll be able to see what's going on. So this is LSAM. And what it's going to do is it's going to give us an output of what's going on. And let me take a little bit of time to explain what it is we're seeing so that um, you won't be too confused when, when you look at this. OK, so the first entry here is our DB2 resource on DB2-101A. And what this is is this is actually uh, DB2 starting. So this is not the database itself, but this is the DB2 engine being started on, on the DB2-101A server. This is the same resource, except being started on the DB2-101B resource. Um, so basically, that's just telling us that DB2 itself, the DB2 engine, is started on both nodes within our cluster. Now, the next one gets a bit more com complex. Um, this is our uh, database resource group. Uh, and what you can see is the first line here is our ITNM database. And you see ITNM in the name. So that's the ITNM database itself. And right now, it's telling us that it is active on the DB2-101A server, which should be correct if we were to go over um, and run, well, we can do it here. We can run db2 pd minus db itnm minus hadr, and it will show us, being that this is on b, it will show us that this is the standby. So that's correct. Uh, the second resource here is our service IP address. Now notice these are tied together, uh, that the IP address is tied to the database. If you had multiple IP, or if you had multiple databases, you could or probably should have multiple IP addresses. Um, and so this is just showing us the same thing, that, that the service IP address is active on this node. And we can actually see that. Let's go over to root on db2-101a. And we'll do if config minus a. And we can see, as I spoke about earlier, the ETH0 colon 0 interface with the IP address that we gave it, which was the 10.192.154.40. And we can actually ping that IP address now. If we were to go over here, say, and ping 10.192.154.40, we should get a response. So that is an active interface now. Back to here. Um, next, we have peer node equivalency. And this is a construct of RSCT. And this is just saying that this node, DB2-101A, is a peer in the cluster. This is saying that DB2-101B uh, is a peer within the cluster. This is saying that either one of these two peer nodes can be the active node in the cluster. And this last one is saying that either one of the two, so this says either node can work, and this says that either um, interface can work. So uh, if, if uh, we have the DB2-101A node active, then the interface should also be on 101A. So that is it as far as setup. We are, we are completely set up now. We have a running cluster that's being monitored, 
and we can actually move our resources around. So let's do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use lssam-top, which is just going to show us a running tally of the status of our databases and our resources. We'll switch over to our DB2B node, and we will do a takeover on the HADR resources. DB2, takeover, HADR on DB ITNM. Now, if we go over here and we watch the status, we should see it change. So it's been locked, so it knows that it's doing something to change the status of, of the database. It's locking them. Now it's moving the one database offline. It's moving the other database online. It brought up the IP address first, and then it brought up the resource. So now if we go over here and we look at this, we should in fact see that we are now primary on this host. And we can do the same thing going back the other way. We'll do the lssam-top here. And we'll fail the database back over to the primary here. And we should be able to watch that process. So again, it's taking things down and figuring out what needs to go where. Then it brings up the IP address first and then it brings up the database on the IP address. And at this point, we can see that it's been moved back over and that it's showing online on the 101A node. And in fact, we can confirm that with our db2pd command. And again, we can see that it's in primary, here, and connected mode. So we're, we're in good shape. So the next thing we want to do, um, so we know that, that that's working okay, what happens if db2101a goes away? Well, let's see. I'm going to, db2101a is just a virtual machine. I'm going to destroy that virtual machine right now. Okay, so that virtual machine is going down as we speak. Uh, and based on the settings we have, within two minutes, we should see the database move over to the um, DB2101B node. Uh, one thing we will see is a lot of red. Uh, when this fails, um, should you have a failure and you look at LSSAM, it's going to be easy to tell uh, <laughs> whether there's a failure or not. Um, and you'll see that in just a minute once this uh, gets active. Okay. So it went failed offline, so our, prime, our resource up above, up here, so our actual DD2 resource went failed offline and offline. That means it's no longer available. Notice it still says nominal online. That's the state it wants to be in. So if it were available, it would try to be in an online state. But since it cannot be in an online state, it's currently in a failed offline state. We can see that our resource here is still online. And now we're, we've got the failover completed. So our um, here, our service IP address is online on our backup node on 101B, as is our database. So let's go ahead and check that and make sure that's the case. So if we do an if config, eth0 colon 0 here on the B machine, we should see that it has the active interface, and it does. And if we go here and run our DB2 PD command, we can see that it is in fact the primary. Notice now though that it is no longer in a peer state, and it is no longer connected, and that's because the other server is down. I'm going to go ahead and restart the other server now. <clears throat> and again, we should see as the resources come back up. So eventually, within one or two minutes, we should see that it all goes back to a normal state. Now, the one thing you will notice is once that everything is back to a good state, that it will still stay active on the 101B server. It will not automatically fail back over to the 101A server. 
in DD2, there really is no concept of, of primary and secondary. There's active and standby. Um, so 101A is not really the primary. 101B is not really the backup. Um, either one is, is, can be active. Um, and it's important when you're doing the install um, that you keep that in mind. You need to make sure that, that when you run the DB2 Haiku, that it's run on the current standby server, regardless of which one you would con normally consider primary or backup. OK, so as the machine comes back up, we should start seeing uh, some of these statuses start to change. Check on the VM, make sure it's coming up OK. It is. So we should see things start coming up here in a minute. What we'll do next after this comes back up is we'll start working on updating um, ITNM to point to the new uh, to the new resource. Um, so once uh, once it's configured like this uh, and you have the service IP address, you will point both your ITNM core and your tip to the service IP address. Um, you won't have to worry about it failing over between the two servers. You'll just point to the service IP address, and the clustering technology will take care of the rest of it from there. expect we should start seeing stuff come up here in a minute. OK. So now it's starting to bring everything back online. Pending online means that it's been sent the signal to come online, but is not yet online. And eventually we should see that lock get removed. There we go. So again, at this point, everything's back up and normal. We have no known problems, oh, except I got disconnected. That was to be expected. That was the A server. OK. So again, at this point, everything's back up and running. Um, but again, notice that it did not move from the A server, or from the B server to the A server. So let's go ahead and log back into our A server. OK. So we can, in fact, go ahead and fail it back over to our A server now. This is the normal way you should do a takeover on the databases. Um, if you force it via, there is a way. Um, and if you go out and study the resources that I've provided, um, uh, you will see that there's other ways to move resources and do things like that via system automation. Um, you don't want to use system automation to move these resources around manually um, because the, when you use DB2 to do it, it does a takeover by force uh, instead of a graceful takeover. So it's important to um, make sure that, that uh, it's important to make sure that, that the database is, is correct. Um, so we should see now that it's moved back over to our 101A server. And that's it as far as our testing and failover goes at this point. Um, so we've set up our clustering. We've made sure that our DB2 server is up and running uh, and that um, failover happens properly even if we fail a server. Um, so at this point, we're in good shape. So what we want to do at this point is go ahead and change. Let's see. All right, so those are what we did. We did the um, takeover from primary and the takeover to backup. We saw both those failover both ways. Uh, we did a hard failover, and we were able to see that, that the backup took over properly. Um, and we restored the server, and everything came back up. And we were able to fail back over to the failed server 
once it came back up. All right, I see there were a couple of questions here I missed earlier. I'll go ahead and take a second here um, before we go further and um, talk about these. Uh, which version of ITNM is supported with this setup? Uh, anything 3.9 past FixPack 4 should be available. Uh, FixPack 4 is the first time that HADR was, was supported. So anything past 3.9, FixPack 4. Uh, does ITNM Tele DB2 agent support TSA configurations or is it aware? I am not sure about that. Um, I would assume so. Um, the HADR is a pretty used, it's a heavily used functionality. I would be surprised if it was not supported. Um, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, and the last question was, are there any special considerations when setting up the disk shared by the databases in a VMware environment? That goes a bit deeper than what I'm covering here today. Um, you can create a resource just like the DB2 res or just like the service IP resource or the database resource that will float between the servers. And um, there are scripts within system automation um, to help you do that. So it is possible to have a shared, fail shared disk uh, to be swapped between the databases in a VMware environment, um, but it's a bit deeper than, than we're planning on going through today. Uh, however, if you go through the, the additional resources, you may well find some information on that. Okay, uh, so we finished our failovers. Um, next thing we need to do is update our ITNM core server. So let's go over here, and <coughs> on ITNM, there will be a, you will have an instance owner on your core server. Uh, if you installed it yourself, it may be DB2 inst9, or if you installed it via <coughs> ITNM, it may be DB2 inst9. Um, in my case, it's DB2 inst1. And we want to make sure that we've cataloged the, um, the DB2 node, uh, and when I say node in this sense, I mean the service IP address. <coughs> and then we need to catalog the I, the database to that IP address. So let's see. We'll list the node directory. And it's already there. So let me do this real quick. Catalog node. I think that is IP. ITNM catalog IP address. Okay. Uh, I forgot to uncatalog these after my last test. My, my apologies. <coughs> okay, so here we need to catalog the DB2 database. Actually, we need to catalog the DB2 um, node first. Catalog TCP IP node, and then our node name, and we're just going to call it ITNM SIP for ITNM service IP address. Uh, remote and our IP address for the server, which is our service IP address, and server and our port number. Now we need to catalog the ITNM DB at that node. So DB2, catalog DB, <coughs> ITNM as ITNM as ITNM at node, TNM SIP, and now we can actually connect to that database, DB2 connect to ITNM, user NSIM, using NSIM, and we can connect to that database. Uh, so the next thing we need to do is update our DB logins and MIB DB logins file. So we've cataloged the remote node, cataloged the remote database, and now we're going to update our configuration. So MC Home, MC Precision, DB logins, HADR. All right, and essentially the only thing we need to do here is go through and change this to ITNM SIP which is the host name I gave for that IP address. All the other information will stay the same. 
And one thing I'll show you when I get done is this was pointed to our HADR database. And even after all that failover, fail back, fail everything, our ITNM is still up and running. We're going to go ahead and stop this domain now because of the changes. We, oh, we need to do the MIBDB logins as well. And then we'll go ahead and stop the domain. And that'll take a minute. Okay, and let's go ahead and restart it. just a minute, but that should come up without an issue. We'll just wait for model to come up. Once model comes up, we'll know that, that uh, the database is working and we can move on to the tip side. We're running a little short on time and I want to make sure we have at least a couple of minutes for questions. Okay, so model's up and running, um, and the rest of them will come up. Model shows me that we have database access. If we did not have database access, uh, that would not have come up. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to our tip server, log in here. And the change we need to do here is rather quick, but we do need to uh, stop and restart the server after the change is made. So we want to go to our database access configuration. And there are actually two changes we need to make, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, and we need the database host. All right, so this one, this one was different. So ITNM SIP. And NSOM. NSOM, NSOM. Save that. Same thing here. And some, and some, and some, and save that. And then we will go ahead and log out. And now we need to go to our tip server and dollar NC home precision profiles to profile. CTNM. So as part of setting up your HADR originally, you will have created um, a setting called TNM Database JDBC URL. And what this does is this allows us to fail over based on HADR. That is no longer necessary with system automation and the service IP address. Uh, however, making the notice making the change in the GUI did not get rid of that. So you'll want to at minimum comment that out. <clears throat> or remove it from the file entirely. The choice is up to you, but it needs to be um, either commented or removed. And the same thing in the NC poll data properties. And we'll just comment that out as well. And now we'll stop tip. And while we're waiting for that to come down, we'll go over here and check on core and make sure that that all came up properly. Somehow I lost my tip window, so we'll open that up again. All right, we'll check the status. It's not running. Okay, we'll go ahead and start tip. I don't know if we'll have time to do another failover. Oh, there's tip. Um, 
but I can do that while uh, we're asking questions. So essentially, um, we've done that. Uh, we did all this. We logged into the server. We changed, made the changes. We saved them. We removed the JDBC URLs, and we restarted TIP. Uh, here we're ensuring the operations of both TIP and core. Um, like I said, I don't know we'll have time to do failover failback, but um, it will work based on what we saw earlier. Uh, here are the additional resources I talked about earlier, getting started guide, recommendations for TSAMP, a little bit of information about the service IP address, uh, network manager best practices for DB2, and DB2HA for net cool products. Um, and all those are very lots of good information there um, all the way down the line. So let's check on our tip here. Shows that it's running. Let's go ahead and log in. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and open for questions, please go ahead and do so, and I'll continue the presentation. But uh, if we can start getting some questions in, that would be good. So what I'll do here, so this is just an easy way to see that you're connected to the database. If you go here and you do a search and give it whatever, um, it actually goes out and does a, a database um, search on this for us. So if you get a response to this, the database is working. Okay, so we got a response here. Let's go ahead and fail over the database again. Uh, I think we're active here. Yeah, so we need B. All right. And D2 take over HADR on D ITNM. All right, and we'll run this again, and we got the same results. If we'd search for something else, we could do like uh, just to show 10.200.100.2. So we're definitely talking to the database. The database followed us as we failed it over. Uh, we can show again that, that um, it is now active on on the server, and that's it. Um, it works the same way if we um, fail it over hard or, or do it via the takeover. Um, and that's it. Those are the only changes you have to make on the ITNM side is update MIPDB logins, DB logins, and update your GUI, and remove the JDBC URLs. I think that covers it for today. Do we have any other questions out there? Anyone? All right, well, in that case, I'll uh, go ahead and do a hard failover as well. I will kill the, where are we active? We're on B now. I'll go ahead and kill the B server. Okay. All right, and that is going down now. We should be able to watch it come up from the A server. We'll do an LSAM dash top here. And again, we've been failing over, failing back, things like that. And if we look here, we should still see that everything's up and running. Nothing has failed. Um, so it's following the connection over as necessary. All right, that was the DB, that was the B server going down. Uh, where's my LSAM top? Why is it not running up there? I guess it's too busy. There we go. All right, now we see that, that the B server is down. Uh, we should see the A server coming up here. Just a second.
And once again, we can go over here and do this again just to show that, again, the DB has moved and we followed as necessary. All right. Any questions, anybody? All right. Well, I think that sums it up then. All right. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending, and a special thank you to Paul and Clark for offering your time and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I think that was a great presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you exit, please take a few minutes to fill out your post-event survey. Your input is very important to us, and we use it to uh, you know, in, uh, improve our future events. But this concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect. Have a wonderful day.